So it's likely that you've heard the terms heart attack, heart failure and cardiac arrest. Now many of you may think these terms are actually the same condition, but this could not be further from the truth. So in this video, I'm going to try to separate these three terms, so heart attack, heart failure, cardiac arrest. So how are they different in respect to their definition, in their causes, the common risk factors, and then the treatment. Now over here, I'll briefly explain their pathophysiology, just so you have a better understanding on how they come about. So then let's start with the definition. So we've got heart attack. This technically or medically, the correct term here is myocardial infarction. So this term myo means muscle, cardial means heart, infarction means no blood flow. So technically there is no blood to the heart muscle. So the heart muscle, at least in the area of the heart, not necessarily the whole entire heart muscle, but an area of the heart, its muscle starts to die because it runs out of blood. Looking at heart failure, this is essentially a pump failure. So over here, we've got a diagram of the heart. We can see here it's separated in its chambers, right atria, right ventricle, left atria, left ventricle. And what happens is blood comes in, deoxygenated from the body to the right ventricle through a valve into the right ventricle where it's pumped to the left, to, sorry, the lungs, gets oxygen, drops off carbon dioxide, comes back to the left atrium from the lungs through another valve down into the left ventricle where it's then pumped to the body. With heart failure, because we can see it's a pump, the pump no longer works effectively. So essentially the heart no longer keeps up with the body demand. So that's what heart failure is. It's just not keeping up with the body demands, whether it's from the right or left side or both. Now, when we look at cardiac arrest, how this is different to those, well, there's just no heart activity. So the heart stops working completely, just stops. Unlike doesn't keep up with enough to the body or starts to die because not enough blood flow, this one is heart stops. So that's the three differences. Now what I'll do is I'll jump in and go through these things together. So now with a heart attack, I'm gonna go through the common causes, the risk factors, treatment. Okay, so with a heart, heart attack, we've seen that it's called an MI, sometimes because the cause of it is essentially the blood vessels, the arteries that are bringing blood to the heart. Remember the heart is predominantly just muscles. It's just a muscle pump. Because it's muscles and it's very thick muscle, it needs lots of blood. So that has some really good blood vessels that bring blood to the heart. These are termed your coronary arteries. Coronary means crown because these vessels go around the heart. So when there's a problem with coronary arteries, we lead to the condition called coronary artery disease. That's sometimes how you'll hear an MI framed within a disease called coronary artery disease. But other, t other times or other terms that are commonly used is what we call ischemic heart dis disease, IHD. Ischemia means a reduction in blood flow, heart disease. So either of these terms mean the same thing. But essentially what is causing the issue? Well, there's a blockage in the blood vessel. Let's say I put the blockage here. In the coronary vessels, we have the left and we have the right, which then branches off into smaller branches. Here on the left, this is a very common location of a blockage called the left anterior descending or the lad vessel. This is very common. The cause of that blockage is something called atherosclerosis. Now I've got a video on that, so I encourage you to watch it if you want to know more detail with atherosclerosis. But what atherosclerosis essentially is, is a fatty fibrous plaque within arteries. This starts to block, in this case, the coronary vessels. What are the risk factors? Well, what leads to the plaque, as you're probably not too surprised. Hypertension, so blood pressure, high blood pressure over time, terrible for blood vessels. So is smoking, so is high lipids in your blood, so is diabetes. 
lack of exercise, decreased exercise. These things aren't very good for blood vessels. So those are your risk factors associated with the cause, which is atherosclerosis. In many cases, the atherosclerosis will then get worse and get a clot associated with it, and that then leads to ultimately the MI. So it's important to note that the blockage to get to the point, one thing I will point out here, when we see ischemic heart disease, this is a spectrum. So on the less worse end, we have a condition or conditions known as angina. Angina just basically means chest pain due to a coronary atherosclerosis. But when you get to an MI, a heart attack, there has to be a complete lock, loss in blood flow to that area of the heart. So an MI is the worst form of ischemic heart disease. So what we're likely to see in terms of symptoms with a heart attack is because firstly the, the heart muscles not get in blood, that's going to start to build up with certain um, byproducts like lactate and as the heart starts to die it releases chemicals it annoys the nerves so we start to see chest pain. The body tries to respond to this by doing a fight and flight response or a sympathetic response. So they'll get sweaty, they'll get cold, they'll feel a kind of a sense of doom, they might get nausea, they might feel sick. Um, these, that shortness of breath, these are common symptoms associated with a heart attack and that's usually because of the onset of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight and flight response. It's important to note that those symptoms are usually, they usually manifest within minutes to hours after the blockage has occurred. So it's kind of not immediate, not as quickly as you'll see in this, but minutes, hours, not quite a day, but it's drawn out a little bit. They're the common symptoms associated with a heart attack. So how do, how do we treat this? How would a person be treated if they're having a heart attack or an MI associated with a, a plaque with a clot in that coronary vessel. Well, as the person is manifesting, like they're having chest pain, they're having those symptoms that we spoke about, hopefully a responder, an early responder like a paramedic will come onto the scene. They will help stop the clot getting worse so that it's common to give aspirin. They will try to dilate the blood vessels so they give nitrates, so that's nitric oxide to dilate the blood vessels. They try to take the demand off the heart so they give something sometimes beta blockers. They might try to take the stress off the person so they'll give morphine. So here you can see there's a, an array of drugs that are, is used. Sometimes if they're not getting enough oxygen around the body they might give oxygen but it has to be below a certain level. And then once they get into hospital they need to try to unblock that. So the cardiologist would put a catheter in, usually down the leg, and bring it all the way around the aorta down to where the blockage is and they will try to balloon and then stent. So stent will hopefully open the blockage and restore blood back to the heart. Another thing that they will do if that doesn't work is they will bypass the clot and so sometimes they'll get blood vessels from elsewhere in the body and bypass where that blockage is. So that's heart attack, so we now know what it is, we know the causes, the risk factors, the treatment and generally the pathophysiology. When we look at heart failure, heart failure as we've said, it's more to do with the pump of the heart. And as I said, there's pumps going to the body, pumps going to the lungs. So we can actually have heart failure that is left-sided and pump failure that, or heart failure that is right-sided. And both. So we can actually have both ventricles being in heart failure. Now, what is the cause for that? Well, what's leading to the left ventricle failing, not keeping up with the body's demand, therefore not putting blood out to the body? Well, one of the most common causes is post-heart attack. So post-heart attack, the person survives a heart attack, so they've had the clot. We start to see a bit of ventricle dying, so that, that therefore the left ventricle, some of it dies. Therefore, it tries to repair itself, but it can't repair itself with muscle. It can only repair itself with scar tissue. That means the scar tissue doesn't do very well at pumping. So slowly over time, the left ventricle becomes less efficient and leads to heart failure. So the, one of the most common of left side is, so I'll put left sided cause is post MI. Another very common cause is hypertension. So as the left ventricle is trying to push blood out 
to the body, if you've got hypertension which is pushing blood back against it, slowly over time the left ventricle will, will try to get bigger, so it will hypertrophy, but eventually it will fail. So it can be also lead to left-sided heart failure. So that's what we call long-standing hypertension. Poorly managed hypertension. So that's two common causes. Another one just is out here we've got the aortic valve. If that starts to become stenotic, which means narrowed, that can also lead to make it harder for the left ventricle to pump against, and that can also left, lead to left-sided heart failure. Right-sided, usually that's associated with something wrong with the lungs, because the, the right ventricle is trying to push blood to the lungs. So if we have a lung condition like COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that can lead to hypertension in that vessel, the pulmonary trunk, which leads to the right ventricle failing. And so that is the common causes associated with that. So the heart failure, what we're going to start to see, depending on where, if it's left or right, if it's a left-sided heart failure, what we're not doing is delivering body, blood out to the body. So we might not deliver enough blood to the brain, so the person might start to develop confusion, or out to the muscles of the body, so they become fatigued and they've got no energy, or no blood, not enough blood to the kidneys, so they're not producing much urine output. So that's the forward effects associated with the left ventricle. But because the left ventricle is failing, that means blood goes back into the left atria and back into the lungs. So we start to see symptoms associated with lung issues. So fluid in the lungs, they start to get a cough. They start to become shortness of breath, particularly at night, they have to sleep on pillows. And this is associated with the backward effects with the left ventricle. With the right ventricle failing, we're not delivering blood to the lungs, so we start to see similar effects as we saw to the forward effects of left ventricle failure. But another issue we see with right ventricle failing is blood goes back to the body. So we get distended neck veins, like the jugular veins. We get a, a, a large liver because it's getting filled with blood, and we start to get fluid down in the ankles. So they're common causes of right-sided heart failure. If it's both, we're going to see both of those things happening. Unlike heart attack, which happens, these symptoms that we spoke about happens in minutes to hours. In heart failure, it probably happens weeks to months. So it's a much longer protracted effect. The treatment associated with heart failure is to symptom manage. So the symptoms that I spoke about, like the fluid in the lungs, the fluid in the legs, you might give diuretics for. You want to make the heart more efficient. So you want to make it more efficient and work less hard. So you might give certain drugs to make the heart more efficient, like beta blockers or digoxin. And you just want to support the heart itself. So you want to do lifestyle changes. So these can be medications, lifestyle. So that leads us lastly to the cardiac arrest. So we know that the cardiac arrest is no heart activity. The underlying issue here is electrical. So what that means is in the heart, I'll draw it over here, we actually have its own neurological system, almost like its own central nervous system in a way. The heart has its own nervous system. Up here in the top of the right atrium is a node called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. That is what we call the pacemaker of the heart. It sets the rhythm and the pace of the heart, more the, the pace than the rhythm. It sends a signal down to the AV node, which allows the, the heart rate to pause for a millisecond, and that allows the atria to finish contracting and push the blood out to fill the right ventricles. And then we have these two nerve bundles called the right and left nerve bundle, or bundle branch, which comes down between the two ventricles and go up either side of the ventricles. And what this is, it stimulates the muscles for the right ventricle. And this electrical signal allows the heart to beat in a nice synchronized manner. This is essentially the lub dub that you hear. The lub dub is more to do with the valves, but that's associated with the right beating, or sorry, the atria beating, the ventricles beating. Atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles. And that allows the heart to fill, empty, fill, empty, fill, empty. And that's governed by the electrical activity. So when we have a cardiac arrest, the common electrical disturbance is something we call VF, standing for ventricular fibrillation, or VT. 
So what that means, instead of the ventricles contracting nicely and pumping blood to the lungs and body, in VF, fibrillation, it starts to do this. So it's like a bag of worms, which means that no effective blood pumping occurs anymore. So the person will get no pulse, no blood's leaving. That means no blood to the brain, they collapse, you take their pulse, no pulse, no breathing, it stopped, everything stopped. This happens very quickly, immediately. So the symptoms here are almost immediate. So that's VF. VT is essentially, it's beating so fast that it has no time to fill with blood. So it's beating so quickly, let's say beyond 200 beats per minute, instead of being 80, there's just no time for blood to fill, to be pushed out. Therefore, again, no blood's going to the brain and the body. The person collapsed, no pulse, no breathing, cardiac arrest. The other common rhythm issue or electrical activity issue is what we call asystole. This is where we have a complete flat line. So nothing is happening in the heart at all. So these are the common rhythms associated with an arrest. How do they come about? Well, one of the most common is again post heart attack. So the person has had a blockage, but instead of damaging the, the muscle, it actually may damage the electrical conduction network. And that then causes a disturbance, which can lead to these or even that, and then that leads to a cardiac arrest. Or maybe they've had heart failure, congestive heart failure over long periods of time, and eventually it leads to an electrical activity, which is leading to an arrest. Other non-heart related Causes of a cardiac arrest could be drug overdoses, near drowning, asphyxiation, things like that, can, which then can lead to an electrical disturbance and lead to these. So that's the causes. What about the treatment? Well, really the only treatment that we can provide in the immediate term is CPR, which is trying to provide um, pushing of blood through the body by manual stimulation or manual um, resuscitation manual compressions. So that's really the only thing we can do uh, in the immediate. We, we do now have more availability of what we call automated external defibrillators, which is essentially stimulating the heart electrically. Particularly that's only going to be effective for the shockable rhythms like VF and VT. The defibrillator will not work in asystole. So with asystole you just have to continue with CPR. And then once medical teams come they may start to apply drugs like adrenaline or other dysrhythmia drugs, which will hopefully rectify this issue. And then they will be taken to emergency to try to fix the electrical problem while supporting the patient symptomatically. So that's the three terms. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of what the differences are between heart attack, heart failure and cardiac arrest, specifically in respect to what their definitions are, their causes, risk factors, common symptomology opposed, uh, in respect to the pathophysiology and their treatments and management. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.